So you know, the next time I'm going to see is one uh, little mouse there and think that he's so lowly. Remember once little brother running in that little corner down there. Yeah, but that's the arrogance of Homo sapiens sapiens who calls themselves you know, this wise creature. <coughs> in any case, they prescribe then social inferiority based upon this assumption, idiotic and mindless assumption, though of great social potency of assumption of biological inferiority. The presumed social inferiority then was woven into the texture of the culture over many generations. And what Henry Billings Brown is saying in effect is that constitutional law <coughs> cannot supersede natural law. In other words, if blacks be inferior naturally, the constitution really cannot supersede what nature has done. Constitutional law cannot just supersede natural law. Cultural norms, social customs, and traditions, which all together have been drawn into a pattern transgenerationally regarding the inferiority of the black individual. And so in a very real sense, then Henry Billings Brown is saying that the Constitution, being a derivative of the culture and society, cannot impose upon the social order patterns of conduct, right? interactions between blacks and whites, social interactions between blacks and whites that are patterns of conduct, social interactions that are hostile to the ethos of the culture and the norms of the society. In short, the Constitution of the United States cannot undo what nature and society have done in regard to matters pertaining to social, the social inferiority, if it be so, of black people vis-a-vis -vis white people. So then, fidelity to the Constitution and the culture necessitates the separation of the races. And that's precisely then what we get constitutionalized in what? Constitutionalized and nationalized in what case? Thank you, Mr. Wood. In blessed be Civil rights cannot be presumed to supersede natural law, social custom, and the cultural norms. Civil rights cannot be presumed supersede natural law, social custom, and cultural norms. One last time. Civil rights cannot be presumed to supersede natural law, social customs, and cultural norms. Second point. Jim Crow assured, assured by law, and that's the critical term here, trans, by law, Jim Crow assured by law, the social economic, political, and legal marginality of black people in the society. It assured by law, the social, economic, political, and legal marginality of black people in the society. Not by my preference, or your preference, or your preference, or others' preference, but by law. It sought to enshrine, enshrine the political powerlessness of black people in the society. This created a framework within which the ability of blacks to penetrate, to penetrate the opportunity structure of the society was severely limited. By excluding blacks from a range of benefits which were reserved exclusively for whites. A range of benefits which were reserved exclusively for whites. Think back to the South Carolina statue, for example, pertaining to working textile needs. That's one example. Jim Crow was clearly a perverse form of affirmative action program for whites. That's what it was. It was a white affirmative action program, but a perverse form of affirmative action. 
it gave whites preferential treatment for no other reason than they were white. Whites were given preferential treatment solely because they were white. Preferential treatment based upon nothing meritorious, <coughs> based on nothing in performance, nothing in behavior, nothing that was deemed to be of particular worth or value. A preference based on nothing pertaining to worthiness. A preference based solely upon an attribute over which they themselves had no control. So it was a preference wholly baseless in regard to merit and having no standing in regard to worthiness. You see, affirmative action, when properly applied, presumes that all things are equal, all other things being equal, then an historical context being considered, a preference is given. What has happened is that affirmative action has been vulgarized since its inception in the mid-1960s whereby some have indeed been given preferences which are aren't. But that was not the intent of affirmative action. All that affirmative action is in its original construction under President Johnson and Kennedy intended to do was to say, in the context of those 11 and one half generations of chattel slavery, followed on by five generations of Jim Crow, how might one open up in some measure the opportunity structure of the society? All things considered. So it is really a vulgarized form of affirmative action that gives a preference where all things are not approximately equal. Not wholly equal, but approximately equal. And so what, um, you know, the critics of affirmative action have a point, which of course in many ways itself has been corrupted, is that it's a very narrow gauge program. I mean, it is not a revolutionary program. It is an awfully conservative program, benefiting really a narrow stratum of the black population, if you think about it, if applied strictly, if <coughs> applied in the way that it was constructed under President Kennedy and Johnson. Because it means that the beneficiaries have to measure up in regard to a whole array of relevant criteria. And then race simply is an additional criteria which may be a tipping factor. So you can see readily why I say, class, then, that Jim Crow was a vulgarized form of affirmative action in regard to his preferences for whites. So then, Jim Crow gave preferences where there, were, there was no approximate equality but an insidious presumption of superiority based solely on race. If one race be inferior socially, the Constitution of the United States cannot put them on the same plane. But it had, a, it had another insidious effect, which was to impel whites towards an unconscious expectation of privileged treatment vis-a-vis -vis blacks. So there was just over those 11 and one half generations of chattel slavery, followed on by five generations of Jim Crow, whites just came to expect unconsciously that they're entitled to a preference where black people are concerned. I mean, and it is not something that parents necessarily taught to their, to their children. It was just carried in the culture, such that there was this unconscious expectation of a privilege privilege routinized both generationally and transgenerationally. And so then Jim Crow came to a third point. Uh, Jim Crow came to a short, um, a transgenerational continuation of white preferential treatment over the years. A transgenerational continuation of preference, white preference vis-a-vis -vis black people. 
as well as the persistence of the transgenerational accumulation of advantages by whites in relation to black. In other words, if I put the same point differently, Jim Crow, if you take 11 and one half generations of chattel slavery, followed on by five generations of the jury Jim Crow, Jim Crow served to continue the transgenerational head start which whites had over blacks. You can see why now <coughs> President Johnson's observation that I read for you as I began the, uh, this concluding lecture is such a powerful one. The Johnson didn't say it explicitly, but implicitly he was grounding his observations in what? Those 16 and one half generations of head start which whites have over blacks. So that's why, you know, if you take away the shackles and you say, no, run the race, but one, you know, one person has been training, next take is a hundred yard dash, you know, has been training a hundred meter dash rather, right? uh, has a superior coach, right? excellent diet, you know, all these new fandangles in terms of sports medicine. And this black individual, right, is down there, boy, you know, out there in the fields, and put him at the race, and say to him, bring him to the line. So you're free now, run, run. <laughs> and when he doesn't win the race, they say, oh, what a poor, you know, guy, just don't have it. Yeah, poor. Uh, in the, as someone who basically uh, got my education in the 1950s and the 1960s, in regard to golf, for example, uh, there was a golfer by the name of Charlie Sifford, who's one of the golfers who broke on the scene in the 1960s, uh, was nearly the golfer that the Tiger Woods was. And there was another golfer whose name I, I slips my mind. But I, I, I do recall. In those days here, well, you know, that um, you know, blacks, you know, that golf is a thinking man's game. You have to really be able to think. It requires more than just physical dexterity. You may be able to run fast, but you have to be able to think. Um, and you know, so the question was you know, do blacks really have that wherewithal to be? play this thinking man's game. Not, no consideration of all the other factors that go into becoming a good golfer. So Tiger Woods break, breaks on the scene and is either the greatest golfer who ever hit a ball or one of the greatest who ever hit a golf ball. And that's not in dispute today. But I find it interesting that on the tour, there's only one Tiger Woods. <laughs> uh, there might be another black golfer, I mean, I don't know who he is. But you see what we have here, right? Tiger Woods, either the greatest or the, among the greatest, but what, what about all the white mediocre golfers that you have out there? And there are a lot of them. Where are the, somebody's talking, question? Where are all the black mediocre golfers? Because assuredly, one would say, if you look at the tour today, there are lots of white mediocre golfers. We are the black mediocre golfers. I remember uh, Senator Roman Peruska from Nebraska in 1969 um, when Richard Nixon appointed a justice to. Uh, for the Supreme Court. His name was Harold Carsdale. He didn't get confirmed by the Senate. Um, and one of the claims about Carswell was that um, he was mediocre. He was a mediocre justice and unfit to sit on the bench. 